As well as a political settlement, there was a religious settlement too. When William took the crown, he wanted to remove the Test Act, which meant there would be no need to take Anglican Communion to be a public office holder. When William faced concerns from Tories and Anglicans, William attempted to pursue a middle path. Influenced by John Locke's A Letter Concerning Toleration from 1689, which favoured toleration, there was suspicion from the Anglican Church and from confrontation from the Tories who believed William wanted to impose his Calvinist beliefs. The terms of the Act meant dissenters were exempt from punishment as long as they took an oath of allegiance to the Crown, excepting they could not enter public employment unless they swore loyalty to the Anglican Church. As a result, dissenters did not have to attend Anglican Church. However, their meetings were monitored. Also, because groups like the Quakers refused to take oaths, they were allowed to declare their denial of the Pope's authority. The Act made it easier for dissenters to worship. By 1714, there were around 400,000 dissenters in England. The Whigs took the humiliation meted out to the Anglican Church and Tories and increased it. They insisted the clergy take an oath to William and Mary like they did to James II. Over 400 parish priests refused and were deprived of their livings. This gave the Whigs an opportunity to replace them with men sympathetic to the Whig cause. The intention of this lecture is for you to consider how revolutionary was the Toleration Act 1689. Knowledge-wise, you will be able to explain what the Toleration Act 1689 did. Skills-wise, you need to analyse the impact of the Toleration Act. And behaviourally, you will evaluate the views of historians on the Toleration Act 1689. The Act of Toleration did not cover Catholics, non-Trinitarians and Jews. Therefore, non-Anglicans were not able to sit in Parliament or hold public office. If they did not swear allegiance to the Anglican Church, they could not attend university, work in the legal profession or practice medicine. They even had to still pay tithes to a church they did not belong to. Catholics really had very little to fear. In 1686, William had joined a number of Catholic powers against the French in the League of Augsburg. Whigs commented Catholics gained the most from the revolution, and Frenchman Henri Misson stated in the 1690s Catholics appeared to enjoy universal toleration despite legal limitations. The Act and Events of 1688-1701 to undermined the established Anglican Church in a number of ways, and the role of religion was also reduced. It was now an accepted fact the Church of England was unable to enforce uniformity and had to accept dissenters. As a result, the population by 1714 was made up of nearly 8% of dissenters. Catholics, despite being excluded from the Act, had a reasonable degree of freedom, even so much as to participate in Mass without trouble. William also used his royal authority to influence judges to curb church interference in the lives of Catholics and dissenters not covered by the Act. In previous years, church courts were crucial to upholding the confessional state, However, the Toleration Act greatly restricted their power. Christopher Hill stated in 1961, The Toleration Act of 1689 finally killed off the old conception of a single state church of which all Englishmen were members. The parish became more exclusively a local government area whose officers regarded themselves as responsible to secular rather than to ecclesiastical authority. Here Hill is alluding to the reduction in the power of the church and how councils and other non-religious institutions were now in control of areas. He continues, The attempt to punish sin by judicial process was virtually abandoned. The laity had won its century-long struggle against the church courts. In this respect to the Middle Ages were over. For Hill, the Toleration Act is the end of religion and the rise of rationality against superstition. Hill then states, the Toleration Act served a political purpose. It was necessary for national unity and the safety of the regime that dissenters should be allowed to freedom of religion. But they remained excluded from political life. This political act eroded the solidarity dissenters had due to their persecution. They had religious freedom, therefore did not need each other to achieve it anymore. In many ways for Hill, the Toleration Act atomised religious radicalism. 
The historian champion in 1999 challenges Hill by saying, to some extent, England remained a confessional state. The Toleration Act 1689 and succeeding acts in Scotland 1712 and Ireland 1719 were establishing rights to public worship to Protestant dissenters, did not break the connection between religious identity and civil rights. Here, unlike Hill, who focused on England, Champion looks at the three kingdoms and highlights this move was not universal. He also alludes to the lack of civil rights given to dissenters. He backs this up by saying penal laws removed did not enfranchise even Protestant dissenters to participate in local and national office. The Test and Corporation Acts 1673-1661 meant that to be a fully competent subject all individuals had to swear oaths of allegiance and supremacy to the Crown and certificate that they had taken Anglican sacraments. These statutory requirements excluded not only the obvious minorities, Catholics, Quakers, Jews, Muslims, atheists, but also many of the more mainstream Protestant dissenters. This compromise between dull toleration of a diversity of religious beliefs and a restriction of full civil liberties to the Anglican Confession was the result of theological origins of the Toleration Act itself. Where Hill states the Act was a political act Champion is challenging this and laying it as a theological or religious cause, as there was no great theological debate amongst MPs and peers. His argument it was a reactionary attempt to maintain order. He says the statutory legislation of 1689 was the result of a complex and careful negotiation between Anglican and dissenting interests, rather than the conclusion of conceptual considerations about the rights of conscience. Such statutory provisions were calculated to avoid much more dangerous alternatives being advanced. The overwhelming imperative was to preserve the authority and legitimacy of the true Anglican religion. So whereas Hill points towards a political drive to protect the authority of the Crown, Champion says it is to protect the authority and power of where the Church was at that time, because ultimately it was the better the devil you know. Both allude to the consequence of the atomization of religious rebellion, however, they have different causes. The intention of this lecture was for you to consider how revolutionary was the Toleration Act 1689. Knowledge-wise, you will now be able to explain what the Toleration Act 1689 did. Skills-wise, you will analyse the impact of the Toleration Act in the associated materials. Behaviourally, you will evaluate the views of historians on the Toleration Act 1689 in the associated materials.